Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those, if your midterm is here, you can come and pick it up. For those who didn't pick your midterm, it's right here. So a few comments about uh, the midterm. You all did really well. So do you like the take home exam? Yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, the, the purpose is, I mean, if I give you this exam in in three hours, you probably wouldn't do that well. But the purpose of the exam is, I mean, the purpose of the course is for you to learn, not for me to, uh, not to, not to uh, make it tough or, or anything. Just the, the purpose is for you to, to understand what the university method is and what, and so I, I was able to, I think I like it too, because I was able to ask you questions that I actually did not cover in the lecture. And so, which, forces you to read or do. So I'm very happy with how you guys did. So what to expect for grades because the, 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 the average was high. So what to expect? If you're, if you're above 100, uh, probably 115 or 116, you should expect an A+. If, if you're anywhere between, uh, if you're anywhere so, if you're grade higher than or above 120, now if your grade is higher than or equal 90%, I don't remember what 90% is, you're, you should expect an A. That's if you continue doing this till the end. If your grade is somewhere between 80 to 90%, if you're closer to 90%, you're probably just make sure you get at 90% so you get an E. Anywhere else, you should expect to be so around an E minus. Any, anything below, you, you should be seriously, you should, because now it depends how close you are to 80 because you got a B plus and B and B minus and also C plus. So it really depends on where you are below 80, but if you got below 80%, with a take home exam, that's uh, really not, that means you're not really careful in the course or you're not really taking the course seriously. So, uh, a few things. Question three the significance of having the sum of the two functions with every point inside of an element equal to unity. What I was looking for is to be able to model rigid body motion. For question five, Uh, the second symmetric, the second matrix was not a symmetric matrix. It was not a symmetric matrix. It was not, it's not from a linear elastic structure. It's not from a linear elastic structure. And that's why we think. So, if it's a linear elastic structure, the, the, the stiffness matrix has to be symmetric. Why, why is this? Because if this is K, F, or the force, is equal to KU. These are all vectors. F is equal to F1, F2. U is equal to U1, U2. And because it's a linear elastic structure, that means there is an energy, there is an energy function that's equal to u. This energy function is equal to f dot u. Because this energy function exists, Ki and Kij 
is equal to partial d energy by partial u i partial, partial u j. And this is equal to partial u by partial u j partial u i, which is equal to k j i. If this is not true, if k i j is not equal to k j i, then energy function does not exist, then I don't, you can't call the structure as elastic. And so, if this is not symmetric, then this is not a linear elastic, or it's not even an elastic. So there's no elasticity, there's no energy function, because, because if Kij is not equal to Kji, therefore U does not exist, and energy will depend on the path. This is U approximate. And if this is the exact stress, then the approximate stress. So the exact solution, the approximate solution for the stress is, a, is, is has to do with the slope of this linear function, and so it has to look like this. And you have to comment on this by saying something about how the, 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 the exact solution is for the displacement is close, especially at the nodes. Between the nodes, it's a linear interpolation. And for the stress, the, the, the exact solution, or the approximate solution, is, is further away from the exact solution. Because we did that because when we are solving the, the equation, we're actually solving for u. And so that the accuracy of its derivatives is not as good as the accuracy of u itself. And the stresses are not continuous at the nodes because we're using those linear C0 functions. C0 functions, they are continuous, but they're not differential. Comment is question number eight. Question number eight. Uh, all of you did, I think most of you got the full mark in this question. The one thing that you all did, which I didn't ask for, is assuming. Assuming this uh, interpolation function to be a 
and for a moment. Now, I never asked you to do this. You have really restricted yourself by saying that the, that the phi of x is a polynomial. It could be a sine function, it could be a linear function, it could be anything. By assuming that it's a polynomial, you really restricted yourself. What we're saying in the question is, in general, by leaving this function as, as general as possible, it could be anything that you want, what would be the weak formulation? Okay? Now, I didn't deduct any marks for that because, I, I mean, you just took an extra step. You did restrict yourself, but I didn't deduct any marks because of this. But you have to be aware that I never asked for this. I never asked for any form for this. You should just have left it as is. So assuming that phi i of x to be a polynomial is a restriction that was never required in the problem. Alright, do you guys have any questions about the midterm? example that you should read that shows that when you're using uh, reduced integration, when reduced integration is used, you'll find that Associated with this uh, mode of displacement is zero strain energy, so the stiffness will be zero, which means you can, this could be equal to infinity, and yet the element does not have any uh, stiffness or any, uh, it's not feeling that this displacement. And that's why reduced integration makes the structure slightly softer because there are some modes that are not, uh, some strain modes that that are not felt. And so when you're using reduced integration, you just have to be careful to make sure that if you have a certain thickness, you have to use, and this, this if you have a structure with, with a certain thickness, you cannot use one element. Because if you apply bending on this, uh, on this, Across, uh, along that thickness, if you apply bending, then 
this structure will not be stable under this mode, and so you have to put more elements. If you put more, more elements, you're fine. So these are the spurious, they're called spurious modes. So, see, so these are the spurious modes where the four nodes reduced integration between quadrilateral element. Any bending mode like this will not be, I cannot uh, capture that bending mode using one integration point. And for the, uh, for the nonlinear element, for the eighth node, so let's uh, just remember, for the eighth node, integration has nine integration points to be able to capture the full uh, uh, strain energy with a good approximation I need nine integration points but to make the calculations faster and to reduce the the stiffness of the structure, because we know the finite element analysis is, is a little bit stiff. To reduce the stiffness and to sum uh, and to make the calculations faster, we can use the reduced integration version. The reduced integration version is done by using four integration points. and some the, the mode that is not uh, the, the mode that's not captured by integrating or by using those four integration points is what is called the hour glass mode and so the, the, the four uh, so if there is a loading that would force the element to deform in this manner then your, the integration points will not capture this deformation and this deformation, this, this displacement can go all the way up to infinity. For two-dimensional triangular isoparametric elements, the uh, linear element because it's a constant string triangle, I need one integration point, one integration point is fine. For the nonlinear element, I need three integration points. And their locations and their weight factors are, uh, you can find them in this figure. So we already discussed element compatibility and the uh, issues with numerical integration. have an example in your uh, text, so look at the example and see the, the difference. So we, in, in this example we obtained the stiffness matrix using different methods, using numerical integration, full integration, and reduced integration. So one, the numerical integration was just done, done using whatever numerical integration that Mathematica uses, which is probably more accurate than the numerical integration, the Gauss numerical integration. So it's a totally third method for integrating. The full integration is the is the uh, four. So for for four nodes, element the, four, uh, the full integration is using that Gauss uh, four uh, the four point Gauss integration, and the reduced integration is using only one. Point. And you can see that the stiffness matrix that you obtain is different. I think this is the full integration. Well, I just just take a look at, at the book. I don't remember exactly which is which, but you can see that all the numbers are different. And so, read this example to see how that the, all these things affect your accuracy of your final M analysis.
finally, before we finish off here, this example will, or this section will show you, uh, will talks about the difference, the difference between the different elements. And what is important is to see is those figures. When you use triangular elements and you plot the stresses, the software smooth, and I mentioned that many times, the software smooths out the stress field. So unless you go in, and I will talk about this a lot next week, unless you go in and, and force the software to not use smoothing, you will not notice. So right here, I went in and made the software not use the, the, the smoothing, and then you can see that the sigma on one, I'm plotting sigma on one, under bending, the, the stresses are really not continuous. You got full, the one element has a certain, uh, because it's constant stress, it's constant strain triangle, so it's constant stress. It's constant stress throughout the whole element, and so you can see highly discontinuous stress fields. So, when you, whenever you're gonna go into using finite element analysis, and you're gonna get a lot of reports, you need to realize that whoever generated those reports probably did not did not does not know that there's the, the, the output from the software is actually uh, smoother than what the actual numbers are. So you need to be aware of all these things. So for the constant strain triangle, this this mesh is really inadequate for bending. As you can see, that the stresses are highly discontinuous. You have one intention and one impression next to each other, there's a huge gradient of stresses. You have a huge gradient of stresses along across the element. That usually warrants that it's a very, that's a, not a very good mesh. So for you to test whether this is a good mesh or not, look at the gradients of the stress between elements. If the gradient of the stress between elements is small, this is a good mesh because we are able to capture the, the gradient of the stress. Because if you're able to capture a gradient in the stress, then the displacement is even better. So good gradient, that means smooth gradient? Yes, if I have the gradient of the stress. So, the, the, for example, the, 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 what we did in the midterm, the example in the midterm, this was the exact solution for the stress. And you would have positive, and then the next element would have negative. That's not a good approximation. So the difference, this is the stress gradient. Now, what I see is this. <clears throat> so this is a huge gradient. Uh, this is a big difference between positive and an element negative next next to it right away. Now it's fine if they're both, both close to zero. So a better so I, I want to be able to capture this is the stress. And I want to be able to capture the stress using constant. For example if I'm using the triangles, if I'm using a constant screen triangle, so it's, so I prefer to find to the, the stresses would look like this. The difference between each element and the next, the difference in the stress is small. And that's a better approximation. And so when when I'm close to zero, the, the, these are not big differences. Is that does this answer your question? Mm -hmm. yeah. which causes these elements to be stiff under bend. 
Now, one last comment is the convergence of finite element analysis. Now, I'm, I used a nonlinear mesh and zoomed in and used a very coarse, a very fine nonlinear mesh and zoomed at the, onto this point to show you that whatever you do, whatever you do, you always get very high stress gradients at this point. And the reason is because this is a point load. I'm applying a point load. From elasticity, equations that I'm, I'm, I'm solving predicts that under point load, in most cases, the stress is equal to P divided by the area, but it's a point load, so I expect the stress to be infinity because they, these are the equations that I'm solving. Because these are the equations that I'm solving, I'm expecting the stress here to be um, infinite. So you need to understand that at point loads, the stress will be infinite. So whatever you do here to make the, the, the mesh finer and finer and finer, the stresses are always going to get higher and higher and higher. And this area will always have very high gradients of stress. And I, I mean, this is, it's, you, you, you don't realize that. I, I was, uh, during our, my postdoc uh, period, I was, we were trying to come up with a new finite element analysis elements for particular application. And we just decided to look at this particular example because it's very, very simple, and we wanted to find the best mesh for this example and we just did not realize that we are always trying to get convergence, mesh convergence, we were trying to get as accurate as possible, but whatever mesh we used, we would always get a different result. Because we never we, we didn't realize that right here the stress is infinity. Or is it is infinite at this point. Because the stress is infinite at this point where we, we you have achieved convergence everywhere, but to try to achieve convergence for the stress that the stress at this point will always be increasing, whatever mesh you use. So if, you, if you're, you're trying to achieve convergence here, you, you have to look at somewhere far from this particular point. All right, so. so far that the, the basic knowledge that you need for an introductory course in finite element analysis. This is what you need for any introductory to finite element analysis. Now you know how to use the software. You can analyze any linear elastic structure. And I assume you also understand the theory behind uh, finite element analysis, what you're actually doing, the linear approximations, the nonlinear approximations, what's reduced integration, what's full integration, what's isoparametric elements. So this is what you need to start using any software or to do any sort of finite element analysis, any linear elastic uh, finite element analysis. Now, people, a lot of people actually use finite element analysis without having taken that course. And uh, it's fine as you have some engineering sense, but I would recommend it because they don't really know what approximation, what's approximation, why does it, why, what does it mean that I have gradients of stress or gradients of strain? So don't. So it's better to uh, take a course before using it. Now you're you're ready to use whatever and, and make uh, whatever uh, software you want, and you understand the basic theory. But because the application is now are more uh, usually non-linear, and you guys are all graduate students. We're going now to cover uh, what is non-linearity. How can we use finite element analysis for plasticity? How can we use finite element analysis for contact? So the remaining part of the course will be a little bit of uh, a little bit of theory and a lot of applications. So today will probably be the last lecture where I'm just going to cover uh, theory. The rest will just be applications. We're going to show you things on the software. And try, we'll try to relate it back to what we are going to cover today and perhaps two lectures from now. And it's now it's the time to start thinking about that the assignments should be simple from now until the end of that.
course, and now it's the time to start thinking about uh, what you want to do for the project. For your project, you you cannot just analyze any elastic structure with a with a, a, a simple geometry for your project. You cannot just solve another assignment for your project. It has to be uh, a lot more complex than an assignment. And the complexity could be there are many forms of complexity. There's material models. You can use something that we uh, you can use a, a complex material model. You can the complexity could arise from the geometry. Maybe your geometry of maybe you're working by mechanics, so the geometry is is, uh, is tough to obtain, and, and you're going to have to utilize other means to obtain the geometry. Maybe you're working in heat transfer, uh, or maybe you're working in uh, um, vibrations, for example. Maybe dynamic, because we haven't really covered dynamic, explicit or implicit. But maybe you want to do something like this for your project. And I would be helping you out. Uh, there's, a, I think, the last lecture. There's no, uh, in the last lecture, the last two lectures will be dedicated just for your questions for your project. So I can just sit with each one of you to go through the project and to see what, uh, if, if you need any help on the software. And the final exam will again be another take home exam and we'll be, we'll talk about it closer to the end of the term. Your projects, let's just look at your calendar. The project, is, I think I decided that the projects for your projects, I need two things. I need a report, and I need a presentation. So I think there's 22 students, so we'll, we'll probably rent, uh, have this room, and I will ask all of you to come and attend the presentations. Each one will have between uh, about 10 minutes to give their presentation about their project. And so I need a, a presentation, and I need a report. And I should prepare, I should post presentation and a report, an example of, good, of a good presentation and a good report on uh, e-class so that you know what you should be writing. Now, for the report, I don't like, a lot, for the report, a lot of students start showing me what they did in the software. They, they capture the software, I clicked here and I clicked that. That's not what the report should look like. The report should be more written in a, in a in a more scientific form where there was an objective and, and there's a, an introduction why you're trying to solve the particular problem that you're trying to solve and then an objective, that's why you're doing this fine attempt analysis then a method, in the method that's when you describe the elements, the bounding conditions, the mesh any other, uh, uh, any other complexity that you use and then the results and then discussion if you want but I don't want to in the methods, I don't want to see, I clicked here, and I clicked on reduced integration. If you tell me I use reduced integration, that's fine. But you cannot just, I'm not asking, it's not, a, it's not an assignment. And so on the 17th, I would want you to give the, the 10 minute presentation and the report. So the report and the 10 minute presentation will be due on the 17th. And I will ask each one of you to come up with their own idea for the project and to uh, perhaps run it by me at some point, if you want, and we can discuss whether it's fine or not. Usually it's okay. And, and, and the projects could be anything related to your research, it's fine, or anything that's related to uh, even, even something that you wanted to do. One of the students who did really well wanted to analyze their, the shaft of their bicycle and under the loads, and because they always broke, he was a cyclist, and something always broke, and he wanted to understand what the stresses are during the stream. And, and, and so whatever you want, it, it, it's fine with me. Okay, so, do you guys have any questions? All right. So what we're going to cover today is Non-linearities. And what does non-linearity mean? Linear elastic structures have this property the equations of linear elastic.
elastic structures have this property. If I have this hole, I will get the solution one one. If I have this hole, I will get a solution that's equal to alpha by 1 plus beta y2. This is what a linear structure, this is what a linear structure is. The, you can analyze the structure under P or alpha P, then the, if the solution is y1, then the solution is alpha by 1 if you just multiply the load by alpha. If the distributed load is w, if you multiply the distributed load by beta, then you, the solution you multiply by beta is the same thing. And the reason why it's linear elastic is because the equation that we're trying to solve, the differential equation that we're trying to solve, admits that it has a certain solution y1 under certain conditions. Now if you change the, the, the boundary conditions for the load and you get another solution, the, 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 the solution to that differential equation is, or the differential equation is linear. So you can uh, uh, do this. And the, the reason for the linear, linearity is the leading reason for the linear is using the small strain matrix because the small strain matrix is linear in U. The small strain matrix is linear in U and the reasons for linearity first using the small strain matrix and second, the stress is a constant multiplied by the strain. Linear relationship between stress and the strain. Now these cause, and, and of course the differential equation itself So this leads to the differential equation B. And so you end up with K U equal F. K is not a function in U. Because K, the, the stiffness matrix, is not a function of the solution itself. It becomes a linear problem, and you just invert that K, find U that corresponds to a certain F. Now most of the problems that we deal with especially in now the softwares that are very uh, complicated or, or zip very, very sophisticated it's uh, uh, you can now analyze many nonlinear problems and so nonlinear problems arise from there are two different or we can categorize nonlinear problems due to two different types one geometric nonlinearities <coughs> and to material nonlinearities. So material nonlinearities, that's if this, that there are different reasons for why a material is not linear. Maybe the stress is not directly proportional to the strain, so I'm not using a linear elastic structure. If I'm not using a linear elastic model, I could be using a hyper-elastic model. So hyper Elasticity. Hyper elasticity is the stress and the strain. I have a nonlinear form. It's not necessarily linear, but it's still elastic. Elastic means there's still an energy, and the stiffness matrix is still symmetric. But the relationship the stress is not equal to C multiplied by the strain. No, there's an energy, and the stress is equal to partial U by partial epsilon IJ. And you, you will, will cite this in the solid mechanics if you're taking the solid mechanics course. If you're not taking the solid mechanics course, 
then we'll, we'll cover a little bit about hyperelasticity in this course as well. Just a small. Uh, so this is one source of material non-linearity. Another source of material non-linearity, or another example, is plasticity. What happens with plasticity? I would stress, and we will do a lot of plasticity in this course. This is the stress and this is the strain. It's linear at the beginning, but at some point, you end up with this and, and this relationship between the stress and the strain, and then if you unload here, then you unload through a different path. So there's a lot of energy lost. There's, a, the, 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 there's not a, a direct relationship between the stress and the strain. There's a nonlinear relationship between the stress and the strain. Because of this nonlinearity, uh, um, the problem becomes nonlinear. So this is what we call material nonlinearity. The relationship between the stress and the strain is not just described by a matrix. It's just described by a matrix. I'm happy this be transpose CV. Then I'm happy to use that C here. But if this C is not linear, if it's not just a matrix, it's a nonlinear relationship, then I have to calculate the C at every increment. Where, where, what solution do I have? And what's the rate of change of the stress with respect to the strain at this that point in time? Geometric nonlinearity. There are many things due to geometric nonlinearity. Geometric nonlinearity is when, for example, the strain, uh, when I'm using nonlinear deformations and I'm using the strain, another form of the strain that's not equal to V multiplied by U. For example, if I use the Lagrange strain, when you use the Lagrange strain, the strain will be equal to maybe B multiplied by U, but this matrix B is a function of U. Because I'm using a, a different form of the strain, the matrix that relates the strain to U is a function of U. So this is one reason why it's it's uh, it's nonlinear. Or something else is contact. Look at that. Can you do this again? <laughs> so another. changing the geometry as you load. So you have a, a, a problem. As you load your structure, you're changing the geometry. You're changing the, 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 the boundary conditions. Boundary conditions change according to you. So the boundary conditions themselves are a function of the displacement of the structure. Every time you get a different uh, displacement, you get a different boundary condition. Because the boundary condition is function of the displacement, then it's a nonlinear problem. Now, very important uh, thing to remember is to to model buckling and contact. You have to invoke the nonlinearity of the geometry in any software, whatever that software that you're using. If that software does not have a nonlinearity, if it's just a, a linear a, a software that only solves linear elastic structures, you won't be able to model any buckle. Because if, if you remember this, the strain, the small strain, the first problem that we solved. In the assignment, the first problem that we solve, when you rotate the element, it sees a strain. Because when you rotate an element, when we rotate an element, epsilon small predicts strain.
which would not allow modeling of what does this mean? It means the following. If I have this structure or this column and I put code here and I put, I put as many elements as I want and as much P as I put the software will just squish your elements. It will never buckle. In a linear, this is the linear elastic response. Why? Because the solution, if the element rotates, it's, it needs way more energy to rotate. Because it needs way more energy to rotate, it will prefer this solution. In order for me to model this, Way that the structure feels that this element really did not uh, did not lose did not absorb energy to go from this state to this rotating state. So it did not absorb energy uh, to walk. So this has to be modeled using a non the geometry because I have to use a measure of the strain that does not punish the element for rotating. Uh, okay, so that's why we're interested in uh, understanding non And um, so what is a non-linear problem? A nonlinear problem looks like this. I have a response. The response should be the displacement. I always start with an initial guess. This is the function of x. I want so that find y such that f of y is equal to f. And the first Assumption is assume or yeah assume assume f of x admits a theory of expansion then we can say that It's not plus delta x is almost equal to f of y, where this is delta x not, that's not, let's say. This admits a theory of expansion, which means this is equal to f of x not plus partial f by partial x multiplied by delta x not. X naught is an initial guess, now plus other terms. This is an initial guess. A 
assume any x naught and substitute in the equation to get your f. This is capital F because this is the solution that we're trying to find. So I have f. I have an initial guess. I calculate. I have to calculate the derivatives. And from this equation, the unknown will be the perturbation in x naught that will keep me closer to my y. So that gets me closer to y. So how would I know whether this is a good solution or not? So delta x naught would be equal to f minus f of x naught. Multiply by partial f of partial x. I'm going to just put here negative 1 for now. Is that right? So I can keep delta x naught. better approximation. So x, x naught plus delta x naught is a better approximation to y than x naught. I started with x naught and then I found another perturbation delta x naught and so now x naught plus that u delta x naught is a better approximation for y. And now what we do is f of x naught plus delta x naught. How much is it different from f? If it's close to whatever f that I was looking for, then I close depends on how, what you mean by close. If it's five percent or however you measure that closeness, if it's close enough, then you have achieved what you're looking for. If it's far, then you just repeat. Then your initial guess becomes x naught plus delta x naught, and you can call it x one. So how close? How close is F to if they are far, then repeat. So how would we repeat? Well now we would say x1 plus delta x1 this is equal to f which actually this is what I wanted to be equal to f this is equal to f of x1 plus partial of f project x multiplied by delta x1. Therefore delta x1 will be equal to project f and project x negative 1 multiplied by f minus f of x1. And so a better so x2, which is equal to x1 plus delta x1, is a better approximation. Now in any numerical algorithm to approximate or to solve an nonlinear equation, 
What you're doing is the following. Let's just now graphically look at it. to achieve F. And I start here. I just have to use another thing here. So what you're doing is the following. This is X naught. the derivative here. This is f of x naught. You calculate the derivative here, and based on the difference between f and x, f of x naught, and based on that slope, you calculate delta x naught. Because delta x naught from this triangle, you can calculate this delta x naught. You calculate this delta x naught, you now have another approximation x1. So this new approximation, now we have another point, which is fx1. And so on. So you're calculating two deltas every time. You've got delta xi, and you're also calculating f minus f of xi. You're calculating a small perturbation in this delta, and you're also calculating the difference between f and fxi. Now, depending on how highly linear the problem is, you might never get exactly f. But you can get a number that's practically f. Practically f means that the f minus f of xi is really small. Now, depending on what the type of the nonlinear problem is, the software will also check how much is that increment that you used to achieve that accuracy. If that increment is huge, the software might, and that's why it's very important to read the message file. When you're doing nonlinear analysis and you're not achieving convergence, it could be that you actually have achieved the solution that you're looking for but this delta, the increments that are large, so that, for example, a structure that's stable you can have a structure where you have a load here and the software is uh, trying this and then trying this is not the best example but and then trying this so it has achieved convergence but every time it puts delta x delta x is huge because delta x is huge every time it does uh, so yes f minus f of xi, the external forces are, are the external forces, is, the structure is in equilibrium, but to achieve that equilibrium, I applied a large delta x. So, just to be safe, the, 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 the software tries again with another iteration, but then it gets another large delta x. Because it gets another large delta x, it keeps trying, so it never achieves convergence, and it tells you that I can't, displacement convergence has not been achieved. So there's two types of convergence, the force convergence and the displacement convergence. So you need to be aware of both. So, and this is what we call the newton nelson method. Now the newton nelson method, the way we describe it right now, is for one degree. One function, that's one degree. Now this is exactly the same. Uh, what I mean by one degree, one degree of freedom. This is exactly the same if it's a uh, multi degrees of freedom. So I'll just give you maybe five minutes until nine or ten, and we'll start again at nine or three.